All right, let's change gears a little bit and we're gonna move over to uh, our next presenter here today. Dr. Leonard Berteau is a board certified family physician and diabetologist. He's a native of the Pacific Northwest. Dr. Berteau grew up in Vancouver, Washington and attended Washington State University. And after medical school at Oklahoma State University, Dr. Berteau completed a residency in family practice at Firelands Regional Medical Center in Sandusky, Ohio, and a fellowship in diabetes care at Ohio University College of Osteopathic Medicine. As a diabetologist, Dr. Berteau cares for and manages treatment of diabetic patients at the Diabetes and Endocrine Center for Adventist Health, partnering up with OHSU. He is a fantastic source of knowledge and expertise. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Berteau. Doctor? Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, just as a reminder, if you guys have questions, uh, we will be doing live uh, Q&A session after my presentation. Uh, so write your questions uh, in as my presentation goes uh, in the chat box. Um, thanks. All right. Uh, so Kara Oregon has asked me here today uh, to discuss uh, the new uh, Kara Oregon diabetes treatment pathway. And here is the pathway. Uh, this is really the meat and potatoes of uh, my presentation. Um, <clears throat> there's been uh, some new changes uh, that Care Oregon has uh, made for us to kind of make things go more smoothly and easier for us as we um, manage navigating uh, taking care of our patients. Uh, and so we'll go through this um, in quite uh, great detail, uh, but as a brief overview, um, you know, <clears throat> the preferred uh, oral agents, obviously number one, uh, First, first line agent is always going to be metformin. I don't think anybody can really argue with that. Um, it's very inexpensive, uh, effective, and most patients tolerate it uh, just fine. Um, and then the second line is also preferred. Um, we should be either considering sulfonylureas or pioglitazone, and I'll, I'll go into those uh, in greater detail um, uh, soon. Uh, and then if the patients uh, fail, both the metformin and or uh, the sulfonylurea and or um, pioglitazone, uh, then we can move on to the third line. And these are non-preferred agents, but um, Care Oregon has kind of opened up uh, some, some medications here for us. We just have to go through a prioritization uh, uh, process. Uh, so one of the uh, options available for us are the BPD-4 inhibitors, uh, and they would encourage us to use the alagliptin. Uh, or the STLT2 inhibitors, which would be the Steglatro or Farsiga, um, if uh, there are um, contributing um, diagnoses that makes Farsiga um, the better choice here. And, and again, I'll go into all of this in greater detail. And you see that there's a prior authorization criteria um, that they want us to follow to get those uh, medications covered. And they do explain that to us uh, quite well there. Uh, and then we go into the preferred injections next. So if by this time you're on your third oral agent, probably should start thinking uh, injections. And uh, the preferred injections are going to be uh, basal insulin, uh, like Basaglar, Semgly, or MTH. And also at this time, we could consider mealtime uh, insulin, like Admelon would be the preferred mealtime insulin. And um, I, I have plenty of patients that have been on uh, three oral agents and insulin and they're still not at goal. Uh, so then we can jump to the uh, fifth line, uh, which are also non-preferred injections, uh, but this is appropriate, an appropriate time to be thinking about these medicines, uh, the GLP-1 agonists. Uh, and they do cover uh, by durian, by ADA, Victoza, or uh, Trubicity. Uh, and they go through the prior um, prioritization criteria as well. So. Again, I'll go through this in uh, greater detail um, now. <clears throat> so uh, initial therapy, again, nobody can really argue this one. Uh, metformin is the gold standard. Um, we should be at least attempting to try this in most every patient uh, if they've not been on oral agents before. Um, metformin is cheap. Uh, it's easy to tolerate and very effective. Um, I encourage my patients uh, to stay on this one. Um, Long, long term, if, if they can, if they can tolerate it, uh, I'll have patients that will say, 
hey, uh, can I can I get off the metformin? And, and and certainly, if they're doing a complete 180 in their lifestyle and they're able to uh, control their blood sugars through just that exercise, I, I fully support that. But I really uh, encourage them, you know, this metformin, you might want to at least stay on a small dose uh, simply because uh, patients who use metformin tend to live longer. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, I'll get them to even just uh, to stay on 500 milligrams at bedtime. Uh, but there's a certain uh, group of patients that just want to get off of everything. And I support their beliefs in that as well. Um, so why should we use it? The durability, uh, they can stay on it long-term. Uh, A1C reduction, you're probably going to get at least uh, a 1% uh, to 1.5% uh, reduction in A1C with metformin. And I've seen patients get even uh, further with that, again, if they're motivated with lifestyle changes. Uh, the dosing guidelines. So uh, for me personally, uh, I encourage patients to uh, start with metformin just 500 milligrams at bedtime. And I keep them on that dose for at least two weeks, if not a full month. Uh, and then I'll slowly advance it up to 500 twice daily. Uh, I'll keep them on that dose for a full month for sure. Uh, and then if they're tolerating it, then I'll bump them up to two pills twice daily. And that's usually the, the target that I'm after is two pills twice daily. Uh, but you see that I give them three months to get up to that dose. Uh, and it's because, um, Metformin can be difficult to tolerate um, right, up, right up front. Uh, if you start at a high dose, um, they can get a lot of abdominal uh, discomfort, gas, diarrhea, and then they're less uh, likely to stay on it. Uh, so if you can start low and kind of go slow with this one, uh, you tend to have better results in the long run. What about chronic kidney disease? Chronic kidney disease is very important to consider with metformin. Um, so, there's been a new consensus statement that makes it easier for us to follow uh, these guidelines. And uh, they're asking us to look at the GFR. Uh, if the GFR is uh, 45 or above 45, then there's no problems. We can use metformin without restrictions. If it's between 30 and 45, um, then we have some restrictions. We can still keep them on metformin if they're already on metformin. Um, however, uh, we can't start the metformin if they haven't been on metformin, and we can't go up in the dose uh, if they're already on a, a certain dose. Also, if they're on 2,000 milligrams, uh, we'll have to take them down to 1,000 milligrams. So 1,000 milligrams is the max dose uh, for patients with a GFR uh, between 30 and 45. Uh, so if they're already on uh, 1,000 twice daily, then I just cut it in half, uh, ask them to take 500 twice daily. Uh, and then they're safe to stay on it. And then of course, if their GFR falls less than 30, they need to stop metformin. So very important to keep that in mind. Sulfonylureas. Uh, sulfonylureas have been around forever. Uh, they're also uh, very inexpensive. Uh, why should we use it? Um, mainly because uh, it's cheap and effective. Um, the dosing guidelines, you know, typically um, we're encouraged to start with uh, glipizide. Uh, I would start uh, five milligrams. You know, you can start before breakfast, before dinner, um, or maybe they just need the help at breakfast, or maybe they just need the help at dinner. Um, uh, and then you can go up from there if you need to. Um, for some patients, uh, maybe they skip breakfast. I certainly want, don't want them taking any in the morning if they're not going to eat breakfast. Um, so for them, I maybe we'll just start at dinner. Typically, the ones who skip breakfast eat huge dinners, and so it'd be more appropriate to start there. Um, what to watch out for? For glipizide, the biggest thing is low blood sugars. Um, too often, uh, I'll see uh, prescriptions say, uh, take it uh, twice daily. And so the patients just get into a rut of taking it first thing in the morning, whether they eat breakfast or not. And then taking it at bedtime after dinner when, when really it's not as appropriate after dinner. Uh, so I really want to encourage um, people to um, encourage their patients to take it before a meal. Um, if they eat breakfast, take it before breakfast. Uh, and if you give another dose at dinner and they eat dinner, uh, take it before dinner. Really important. Um, it, it can also cause uh, weight gain. Uh, so uh, low blood sugars and weight gain are the things to watch out for uh, for those. Thiazolidinediones, uh, this is uh, actose or pioglitazone. Um, yes, uh, this medicine is still around. And yes, uh, we can still use it when it's appropriate for patients. Um, and in fact, we can consider uh, 
the um, hydrodazone in place of a sulfonylurea um, if we'd like. It's very inexpensive, uh, it's safe, it's once daily, it helps with the, the um, <clears throat> insulin uh, resistance aspect of this disease. Uh, and it's actually quite effective, uh, quite well tolerated. Uh, so why do we use it? Uh, if we're thinking uh, this patient is uh, insulin resistant, uh, it helps dramatically. Uh, when do we use it? We can use it uh, second line after metformin. Um, and it, it's really safe. Uh, you don't have to worry about low blood sugars with this one. Uh, however, what to watch out for, uh, there can be some swelling, uh, swelling in the legs, uh, but there can also be uh, uh, fluid uh, retention. And so we really have to be careful with this uh, in patients with heart failure. In fact, we should avoid it in patients with heart failure. Certainly it's contraindicated if they have mean or class uh, three or four heart failure, because uh, this could put them into acute heart failure. Um, <clears throat> it can also cause weight gain. However, uh, the weight gain that you get from uh, the pioglitazone uh, usually is um, just a modest amount um, and they don't continue to gain weight. They'll just gain what they gain on the uh, uh, pioglitazone uh, and then they don't keep gaining and gaining and gaining. Uh, so, so, so then what, uh, how do you decide what to do next? So yes, so once we've gone through the two, uh, first two tiers, um, you know, it's pretty easy to get here, uh, but then <clears throat> once they've failed uh, the two um, uh, treatment modes, then we, we start thinking about the third uh, treatment mode. And really we should be thinking about uh, what's gonna be best for our patients here. Uh, so add-on therapy. So this is when we start looking at the newer agents. Again, uh, these are the non-preferred and will require catheterization. So when you're thinking about these, try to come up with, okay, Here's a reason why I feel this one is good um, because you'll have to uh, mention that in your catheterization. Uh, so factors to consider, concomitant chronic diseases. Um, our choices are uh, the DPT-4 inhibitors and the SGLT-2 inhibitors. Um, so uh, why, we, why we use one versus the other, uh, when we would consider this, what to watch out for and factors to consider. I'm actually gonna talk uh, more about these individually. So I'm just moving on to the next slide here. So uh, the DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, and Kara again wants uh, us to consider allogliptin uh, when we think of these. Um, so DPP-4 inhibitors, our bodies uh, produce incretins uh, right after we eat. And what the incretins do is uh, help us utilize our food um, effectively. So it slows our digestive tract down, uh, makes us feel full. Um, it uh, allows the insulin that we produce to be more effective, more efficient, um, and uh, it also decreases glucagon in the face of a meal. All good things that we need uh, when we eat. Uh, however, uh, most uh, type two diabetics uh, lose um, incretins or they don't produce as much. Uh, so you don't always get those uh, positive effects around the meal time. Well, what the DPP-4 inhibitor does is normally uh, when we produce incretins for a meal, uh, we produce this enzyme right after the meal uh, called DPP-4s. And those enzymes break down our incretins so that we'll be hungry uh, for the next meal. A DPP-4 inhibitor does exactly what it sounds like. It inhibits that enzyme from breaking down the person's uh, incretin uh, during meal time. So for the diabetics that uh, produce some, but not a lot, uh, we get more out of their incretins by using these DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, they're actually quite effective, at least I found they're quite effective if you can use them early in the disease process. So if the patient's had diabetes uh, for just a few years, oftentimes they have enough pancreatic function that these DPP-4 inhibitors can be quite effective. <clears throat> and you'll see somewhere between uh, one half to a full, um, percentage uh, A1C reduction, especially if you're using it early. If you throw it on kind of late in the disease process and you think that they don't have much uh, pancreatic function left, uh, you're really not gonna see a, a huge benefit with this. But if you use it early, um, I, I tend to get better results. Um, what to watch out for is, so the main benefit with uh, um, DPP-4 inhibitors are the toler is the tolerability aspect of this medicine. Um, it's just a once daily pill. And most patients tolerate it really well. Uh, if you look up in Hippocrates, uh, the side effect profile for this one, it's a really short list. Um, and most medicines have quite a bunch of side effects to watch out for. This one is quite minimal and most of my patients tolerate it just fine. Uh, what's interesting is the ones that don't tolerate it, 
I can't really tell you that this is the one side effect that they get. Each patient kind of uh, gets a different side effect. But like I said, most of my patients tolerate these just fine. Uh, I will tell you that um, uh, if you do get a, a side effect, the, the one that's listed most common is upper respiratory infection. Um, again, that's not one that I see common. I, I rarely see side effects with this drug. So. Um, uh, the next one are the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, so Stiglatro um, is, is the one that Kerrigan wants us to consider, uh, or Farsiga in appropriate patients. Uh, so SGLT2 inhibitors. These uh, are um, new drugs that uh, have been uh, found to be very effective uh, and have lots of side benefits as well. Uh, so how do SGLT2 inhibitors work? Uh, basically, um, <clears throat> We, if our blood sugar gets too high, uh, we eliminate uh, the glucose in our urine, but usually that doesn't uh, come into effect unless our blood sugars are significantly high, like say over 250. Um, what the SGLT2 inhibitors do is they reset the uh, calibration of our uh, kidneys to get rid of the glucose at a much lower level. Uh, and so essentially we're getting rid of our glucose with the help of the SGLT2 inhibitors when the blood sugar gets up over 150. Uh, and that's had some very positive effects, obviously, on uh, controlling blood sugars. If we can get rid of it, get it out of the body, uh, that allows us to bring those sugars down more effectively. There's also some other positive uh, benefits, uh, in particular, uh, weight loss. Uh, so we've seen some weight loss uh, associated with uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, I've seen pretty effective uh, lowering of A1Cs as well, at, at least uh, a percentage of the A1Cs, if not more. Um, <clears throat> when should we start uh, considering these? Uh, yeah, I like adding it on as a, a third level. Uh, I think it uh, works really nicely, especially with the benefits that come with it. Um, what to watch out for? Uh, side effects. There's always side effects to every drug, and this one is uh, no different. The main side effects, uh, it can um, actually lower your blood pressures, and it can lower the blood pressures too much, uh, so watch for uh, dizziness, lightheadedness. Uh, it can make the patient urinate quite a lot more, especially if they get into something that's very high in carbohydrates. Uh, so encourage them to um, just be cognizant uh, that they'll be peeing a lot more, maybe to try and avoid the high carb foods. Um, I, I have one patient that loves uh, the SGLT2 inhibitor that he takes. Uh, the main reason he says is it's a constant reminder to adhere to a good diet, because if he gets into something, he's going to be peeing all day. So. Uh, he uses that as a positive reinforcement for himself, which is kind of nice. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, since there's a lot of sugar in the urine, the main side effects to watch out for are going to be urinary tract infections and yeast infections. Now, um, the urinary tract infections and yeast infections are common, uh, obviously, a lot more with my uh, female patients. Uh, however, I have seen... Um, yeast infections with the male patients, uh, in particular, the male patients who are not circumcised. I should say that's the only time that I've seen it is uh, the pa male patients who are not circumcised. Uh, but for the rest of our males, um, uh, usually I don't get those uh, side effects at all. So, um, so I really want to spend some time uh, to differentiate when should we think of uh, Farsiga over the Stiglatro. So the huge benefit that the SGLT2 inhibitors have is that it helps uh, reduce our risk of uh, heart disease. It helps reduce the risk of heart failure. And it also helps reduce the risk of uh, chronic kidney disease. And so um, Care Organ has encouraged us to use the Stiglatro first uh, because it is cheaper. However, uh, they realized that Farsiga has some significant advantages uh, over the Stiglatro. And so if you have a patient with heart disease, if you have a patient in heart failure, or if you have a patient um, who has chronic kidney disease, uh, I would encourage you uh, to use Farsiga in place of the Stiglatro. Um, and again, this is going to uh, require preauthorization. So just in your uh, preauthorization uh, paperwork, just make sure you mention uh, that the patient has the, uh, the comorbidity that makes the Farsiga the better choice here. Uh, so uh, when to consider basal insulin. So once you get to um, uh, basically three oral agents, and they're still just not at goal. Um, it, it's time to um, approach, approach the subject um, to your patients that, hey, I think it's time for uh, insulin, uh, or at least an injectable. Um, 
basal insulin is uh, very appropriate uh, as a next step, and this is preferred on Oregon. Um, easy to get it covered. Um, Basaglar, Semgly, uh, or NPH. Uh, Basaglar and Semgly are probably the easiest ones because one, they come in as pens, uh, and two, um, this is the same uh, molecule that, that Lantus is. So they're just different brand names, uh, but, but it is essentially Lantus, and we're all very comfortable using Lantus. Uh, it's just a once daily injection, uh, so it's a good way to introduce patients into injections. Um, and oftentimes we can control patients with just a one daily injection. So choosing insulin, uh, Basaglar, Semgly, I just went over that versus NPH, um, what dose, what time of day, and when to test. Uh, so I feel that Basaglar and Semgly are much easier because they're just once daily. Uh, they're a true basal insulin, so you get a nice flat um, um, action uh, throughout the day. Whereas NPH, um, while that's uh, very inexpensive, uh, you do have to give it twice daily, give a dose um, before breakfast and give a dose either before dinner or at bedtime. Um, so what dose? We're actually gonna go into uh, dosing a little later. Um, so I'll, I'll go through that with you. Uh, what time of day? Uh, I like to give it at bedtime. Now really it's the Semgly and the Basil are, are true 24 hour insulin. So you could take it anytime. Um, and in fact, I'll tell patients when, when they struggle to take it at bedtime, you know what, take it before dinner, that's fine. If you remember to eat dinner every day, take it then, that's fine. Uh, so just, it's more important that they take it each day and that they take it at the same time. So if they have another time, it's easier for them. Um, I know that a lot of people uh, give it first thing in the morning. I'm fine with that as well. Again, it's a 24 hour insulin. Uh, and there's a potential for less uh, overnight lows when you give it first thing in the morning. I tend to give it at bedtime because that's when I need it to work the most uh, is overnight. Um, in particular, when we first wake up and we're most insulin resistant, that tends to be when uh, these basal insulins um, are having the, the best effect. So timing wise to me, that just matches up well. Uh, and then when to test. So of course you test um, first thing in the morning uh, because you're, um, you're monitoring their fasting blood sugar. Uh, the basal insulin acts the most uh, overnight uh, when we don't eat. And so we get the best indicator if our uh, basal insulin is working with that uh, first fasting uh, blood sugar of the day. Uh, bolus insulin. So when do we start uh, considering uh, adding uh, analog or fast acting insulin for, for meals or real time insulin? So if you're, um, uh, if you're increasing your, ins your basagar or your assembly um, to really high levels uh, and um, you're getting great morning sugars, but the A1Cs are still high, uh, that's a good clear indicator that it's time to move on to a mealtime insulin uh, as well as your longer term insulin. Um, the other thing I'll see uh, uh, some providers do is uh, increase the uh, basal insulin they actually get low blood sugars overnight, and yet their A1Cs are still high. That's another clear indicator. They don't need more basal insulin. In fact, they need less. Uh, they, they need uh, mealtime insulin. Um, so your, your basal bolus ratio should be about 50-50. And so if you're on the correct dose of basal insulin, you should be using that much uh, bolus insulin uh, throughout the day as well. Uh, and we will get into um, uh, that in greater detail um, soon here. Uh, so when basal uh, insulin alone is not enough, if the A1C is above uh, 2% uh, target still, uh, then we should move on to the next level. Uh, when A1C values are still not at target on basal and your fasting blood glucose are, are at target, uh, just like I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, if your postprandial blood sugars remain above target, so if you have patients checking other sugars during the day and basically they go higher and higher throughout the day, that's a clear indicator that they need more than just basal insulin. Or, and this is important, your total ba uh, basal insulin exceeds uh, 0.5 units per kilogram. Um, we sh if, we're, if we're past that amount, uh, we really shouldn't be uh, increasing the basal insulin. We should look at adding uh, something to it. And our options are uh, advanced insulin therapy with additional prandial insulin. Uh, your basal bolus insulin regimen or uh, pre-mixed insulin. We could use this as an opportunity to stop the basal insulin and change them onto something called uh, 70, 30 or 75, 25. Uh, and I'll go into that in more detail. 
Um, or uh, now is a good time to consider adding a GLP-1 agonist um, if tolerated, not contraindicated, and is a, uh, affordable for the patient. All right, so 70-30, what, what is 70-30? 70-30 uh, has 70% long-acting and 30% short-acting. Uh, so if you want to make it easy um, and uh, the patient is pretty uh, consistent at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, you can actually stop the basal insulin and start 70-30 in its place. Uh, and that has both the long and short acting. So you give them a dose before breakfast and a dose before dinner, and you cover uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and overnight. So with two shots, uh, you take care of all of their uh, basal bolus needs throughout the night. Uh, so what are the benefits? Uh, you get basal and prandial coverage. Uh, there's less injections. You only have to do two, one before breakfast, one before dinner. There's also less confusion um, on units to inject because you just tell the patient, I want you to take X amount before breakfast and X amount before dinner. Um, usually it's just uh, one insulin vial, uh, which may be more realistic uh, option for patients with uh, unstable housing or no place to store. That might be the easiest thing for them. Uh, or it also comes in pens as well. Uh, and I don't have any problems getting pens covered. Um, so that's uh, easy and convenient for them as well. Now, the cons, uh, you are stuck with that 70-30 ratio versus what the basal bolus insulin needs usually are, which is 50-50. Uh, don't ask me why, but when you give it a 70-30, it actually works uh, quite e efficiently and quite effectively. Uh, but again, you're stuck with that ratio. So uh, there's not a lot of nuance or, or, or plays uh, with, with the dosing. Um, it's less fixable with dose adjustments. So um, if a patient varies what they eat from one day to the next, 70-30 um, doesn't really accommodate for that because you're, you're stuck with the same dose day in and day out. So these work better for the patients that are really consistent with their meal times and how much they eat uh, at meals. Um, and then there's no flexibility as far as timing either. Um, so I always tell my patients, I make a really big deal about this. If you're gonna be on 70-30, um, take it before breakfast and make sure you eat lunch about four hours later because 70% of that insulin, that morning dose is gonna kick in at lunchtime. And if you have a patient who tends to skip lunch, this isn't appropriate for them. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it, along with that, uh, it requires patients to eat consistently uh, both time and carbs. I think I kind of went over that a bunch already. Uh, what about uh, insulin resistance? Um, so obviously insulin resistance is a, a pretty big issue. Um, and again, uh, when you get to this level of the treatment algorithm, we might start consider uh, the resistance aspect and we might look at the, the GLP-1 agonists uh, to help us overcome that. Also, uh, just backtracking a bit, uh, if insulin resistance is an issue, um, remember that pioglitazone can be very effective with insulin resistance. Certainly metformin is. Uh, weight loss is our best uh, weapon uh, to help with uh, resistance as well. Uh, so just keep that in mind. All right, so insulin therapy uh, in type two diabetes. Let's go through this a little more in detail as far as the dosing. Uh, so if we look at just uh, initi initiating basal insulin, uh, you could start uh, 10 units a day. I do encourage you, go through the math. The math isn't that hard. 10 units a day might not be nearly uh, as much uh, as what's needed for a, a very big patient. And it could actually potentially be too much for a really small patient. So I do encourage you uh, to do the math of um, either 0.1 or 0.2 units per kilogram. Um, actually, what I do is uh, 2.5 units per kilogram. And where I come up with that is um, you take, uh, so, so the starting doses for a type two diabetic should be anywhere from 0.5 to one unit per kilogram. Now, if they're brand new to insulin, you really should uh, use 0.5. And 0.5 is your total daily dose. And remember half of that is basal insulin, the other half is bolus insulin. Uh, so your mealtime boluses. So that's why uh, I start with uh, 2.5 units per kilogram, but this uh, 0.1 to 0.2 would be very safe, uh, safe place to start. And then you can slowly up titrate from there. Um, all right, and then, uh, then adjust. Uh, what I do is I typically encourage patients, again, I want them checking their fasting blood sugars. And I tell them to increase by two units every three days until their morning sugars are consistently under 150. 
And yes, I said 150. Um, I try to give them a very realistic target in the morning. Uh, and if your average sugar is less than 150, your A1C is going to be under seven. And I think that's our goal. So um, I tend to be very successful with that as a target in the morning. And I also tend to avoid uh, overnight lows and morning lows when I uh, go for 150 in the morning. Uh, now, if they're having low blood sugars, it's because we've titrated up too much. And so I'm very quick to decrease the insulin. Uh, in fact, I would encourage them to reduce by four units every time they wake up with a low blood sugar or every time they have an overnight low blood sugar. All right, so if basal insulin isn't enough, then let's start looking at uh, adding rapid in acting insulin. You could just start four units before each meal, which I think is very appropriate. Or again, you can do the math here, uh, 0.1 unit per kilogram. Um, and I would say, um, yeah, 0.1 unit per kilogram is, is a safe place to start and you can titrate up uh, as needed. Um, <clears throat> again, you can adjust it by two units uh, every, uh, like once a week or twice a week uh, until they're, um, blood sugars are, are at goal. So here's how I uh, make adjustments for the mealtime insulin. So if you're looking at just the um, pre-breakfast insulin, I have them really focus on their lunchtime sugar. If their lunchtime sugar is greater than 150, then they need to go up on the pre-breakfast insulin. If you're looking at lunch, then uh, have them focus on their dinnertime uh, sugar. So if their dinnertime sugar is over 150, have them increase their uh, lunchtime insulin. And then if their uh, blood sugars are high at bedtime, they need more insulin before dinner. Um, now my target at bedtime is uh, less than 180. So I do want them to go to bed with a little higher sugar, or I should say it's, it's okay for them to go to bed with a, a little higher sugar, uh, just to help protect them from going low overnight. Have you, have you noticed that I really don't like lows? And in particular, I don't like them overnight. Uh, so my target is less than 180 at bedtime. If they're over that target, then I'll have them increase their dinner time dose. Uh, and of course, if they're having low blood sugars, back off on, on their mealtime dosing. It's pretty obvious if they're going low after breakfast, it means that uh, you're on too much insulin at breakfast and or they're not eating enough carbs. So I really don't want to increase their carb intake. I'd rather have their uh, insulin matched at that meal. Uh, you'll, you can also see it at, at lunchtime, they'll go low after lunch or if they're going low after dinner. Make sure you back off on those appropriate mealtime insulins. Again, this is a good time to be considering a GLP-1 agonist, um, and we'll go over that uh, in greater detail. However, if they're already on a GLP-1 agonist, there's uh, either they're not tolerated or their A1C is still not at goal, uh, then we might consider either at this, at this time, if we haven't added the mealtime insulin, adding the mealtime insulin, or just switching them to 70-30. Uh, uh, so change the premixed insulin uh, twice daily before breakfast and dinner. Uh, you can start uh, uh, by the current basal dose, uh, divide it into two thirds in the morning or one third at night. But I'm gonna give you uh, actually a, an easier, um, more effective uh, trick here. Uh, if you just take their um, weight in pounds and you use their first two digits, that's a very safe, effective place to start with 70-30 uh, um, insulin. So you give them, for example, if the patient is uh, 217 uh, pounds, you'd give them 21 units before breakfast and 21 units before dinner. I found that uh, most American diets, they eat enough uh, carbohydrates at dinner to, uh, to equal uh, the amount of carbs that they eat at breakfast and lunch. And so that's why I, I tend to start off with giving the same dose at breakfast and dinner. Uh, and then I adjust from there. Uh, so what I'll tell my patients is adjust your morning time dose until your dinner sugars are consistently under 150 and adjust your dinner time dose until your morning sugars are consistently under 150. Uh, and again, I'll encourage them to increase two units every three days uh, until their sugars are at home. Um, so uh, pretty easy, especially if they're very consistent with how they eat. Um, again, this regimen doesn't work as well um, if they're very chaotic on their eating patterns. And of course, if they're having low blood sugars, uh, reduce the insulin. If they're going low after breakfast, before lunch, after lunch or before dinner, they need to reduce the morning dose. If they're going low after dinner, overnight or in the morning, they need to reduce the evening dose. Um, pretty obvious and focused on that. All right, so now we get to spend a little more time on the GLP-1 agonists. Um, 
So you remember earlier when I was talking about the BPD4 inhibitors, I was talking about incretins. A GLP-1 agonist acts like an incretin. It's an artificial incretin, if you will. Uh, and um, when patients get to a level where they don't produce any or very little, if we give them in large quantities, we have some very uh, good effects. Um, the least of, uh, or, or the least, the, not, not the least of which is um, a significant weight loss, especially if you have a patient who's motivated and making lifestyle changes. I've found that uh, these GLP-1 agonists really help uh, springboard their uh, efforts into the positive direction. Um, it also helps them feel full with less food. Uh, so if you encourage them to eat less food, uh, it works, it works really well. It also, again, uh, lowers blood sugars quite dramatically. I've seen at least a 1%. Um, in fact, I've seen patients uh, that have really high A1C and I can get them the goal uh, with the GLP-1 agonist. Um, Oftentimes, it's because they're uh, motivated to make changes, uh, but again, it really helps support their efforts. So I just see positive benefits all the way around with, with these. Uh, when we use it, combinations uh, that make sense. So again, uh, we're at the time where basal insulin isn't doing the trick. Uh, and if we think that adding uh, the GLP-1 agonist would, would really help, that's a great time uh, to add it. I, I, I've seen that basal insulin with a GLP-1 agonist acting basically as their mealtime uh, coverage, if you will, uh, tends to work beautifully. Um, <clears throat> should, should I add uh, prandial insulin or GLP-1 agonist? So you might ask yourself at this level, when we're looking at, do they need mealtime insulin? Uh, should I go that route or should I do the GLP-1 agonist, which is appropriate for the patient? Oftentimes, I'll have the discussion with the patient, and of course, they're going to elect to take a once weekly shot versus a, a shot before each meal. Uh, but I also feel it's very appropriate for those patients that are uh, obese uh, and weight loss is imperative. The prandial insulin is only going to contribute to more uh, weight gain, whereas this GLP 1 agonist can, can really help uh, with weight loss. Uh, so, what to watch out for? Um, the main side effect for the GLP 1 agonist is going to be nausea. Um, you encourage patients uh, to, number one, expect some nausea. Uh, number two, if they get nause nauseated, have them stick with it for a couple of weeks because usually the body gets used to it. Um, and also really encourage them to eat less. Uh, if they eat less, oftentimes you don't get uh, as much nausea. Um, if after two weeks they're doing everything right and the nausea is severe, uh, then this isn't the right drug for them. Oh, I also encourage them if I go up in the dose uh, to watch for another round of nausea. Again, stick with it for two weeks, eat less, uh, and hopefully your body will change that. Okay, when to refer uh, to a specialist. Um, if you've got a new onset type 2 diabetic with an A1C greater than 12%, uh, I'm going to do something called uh, um, rescue uh, therapy, uh, where I'm going to put them on uh, injectables. Uh, very likely um, long-acting and short-acting insulin right from the get-go. Um, and what I do is I rescue, I call it rescue therapy because I'm rescuing their beta cells at this point. If they're new onset, um, this, this is like the most fun patient that I get to see. I know that their beta cells are uh, still alive. Uh, they're just not working due to glucose toxicity. I take care of that glucose toxicity and I've seen some pretty tremendous results with uh, um, after about six weeks, I'm able to get their uh, insulins off uh, and they're able to control their um, blood sugars, usually with just metformin alone at that point. So uh, feel free to send them my way because they're not going to like the idea of getting on uh, four shots a day when they're just brand new diagnosed. Uh, also, uncontrolled diabetics who are already on basal bolus insulin therapy. I have lots of uh, knowledge with, or a specialist would have lots of knowledge with um, being able to kind of overcome obstacles, uh, things that patients tend to do wrong, um, or uh, just teaching them better how to, to use uh, basal bolus insulin therapy. That's fast-acting insulin along with the long-acting insulin. Uh, gestational diabetics should be seen by a specialist. Type 1s uh, should probably be followed by a specialist. These patients are very difficult to manage their blood sugars. And uh, in that vein, uh, we have insulin pumps, uh, pumps and sensors that have really made uh, some amazing uh, uh, ground with uh, taking care of uh, the more complex diabetics like a type one. 
Uh, and also keep in mind that pump manufacturers uh, can address uh, pump malfunctions. Uh, so if a type one diabetic calls you and says, hey, my pump's broken, send them to the manufacturer. That, that's uh, what they do. All right, so I do have a case study and I think this uh, illustrates uh, kind of what uh, this algorithm is trying to accomplish. So, and this really did happen. Uh, this is a 32 year old female. She came in weighing 425 pounds and she's only five foot 10 inches. Uh, when I first met her, she was already on uh, metformin a thousand twice daily and she was on Actos or pioglitazone 45 milligrams daily. So she was pretty maxed out on two medicines already. Uh, her A1C was 7.1. Now you might say uh, 7.1, that's not bad, uh, but technically that's not a goal. I would like to see her less than sick. And more importantly, um, we have a pretty big issue with, uh, with weight. Uh, <clears throat> so I placed her on Bieta. At the time, all I had uh, was Bieta. Uh, Bieta was um, a, an injection you take right before breakfast, right before dinner. Uh, I'm sorry, you take it 30 minutes before breakfast, 30 minutes before dinner. And I started her at the five microgram dose and then quickly uh, advanced her to the 10 microgram dose um, before breakfast and dinner. So when I saw her three months later, she had dropped down to 388 pounds. That's tremendous weight loss. This patient was motivated. Uh, and like I said, the GLP-1 agonist really helped to springboard her in the right direction. And her A1C had dropped uh, down to 6.4. Now we're at goal, now we're at target. Uh, but more importantly, we're starting to see some weight loss, which will really benefit her in the long term. So this was 12 years ago, and uh, I just saw her recently. Um, we've advanced her to a more, uh, a newer uh, GLP-1 agonist, the once weekly Ozempic. Uh, she's no longer taking metformin because she was having pretty significant diarrhea from it. And she also stopped taking the Actos uh, due to the swelling and the weight gain that was associated with it. But with just the Ozempic once weekly, she's uh, been able to maintain her weight loss. She's now down to 331 pounds. And her A1C, 12 years later, um, is fantastic at 6.1. So I really do believe that these GLP-1 uh, agonists have a role. And uh, like I said, Care Oregon is starting to have these uh, now when it's appropriate. Uh, what about nutrition? Uh, does it make sense to count carbs for type twos? Absolutely. Um, Oftentimes, that's a skill that's difficult for them, although I would still encourage them to try. Uh, but at the very least, be cognizant of the carbs that they're eating and try to reduce the carbs that they're eating. Uh, what uh, nutritional strategies or diets uh, are particularly effective? I would say the low carb uh, uh, diets are effective. Um, the keto diet uh, actually is quite effective uh, with, with uh, type twos. My only concern about the keto diet is most type two diabetics can't stay on it forever. And when they start eating carbs again, uh, they end up uh, gaining back all the weight that they've lost plus interest. So I really encourage my patients, if you're looking at a low carb keto diet, I'd rather you learn how to eat low carb forever, not just uh, keto for short, short terms. Um, and then the, the weight loss is a little more gradual, but then it's more uh, permanent. So. Uh, also, uh, intermittent fasting has been shown to be quite beneficial uh, for uh, type 2 diabetics. So I'm a big supporter of intermittent fasting as well for my patients. If you can convince a patient to just make one change, what would it be? Um, for me, uh, one, one change that, that I often ask them, if they're drinking tons of soda uh, or milk, I'll ask them, can I just get you to, to drink water in place of, of those two? And oftentimes they'll hem and haw and I'll give them tricks like, well, you know what? Add a little bit of fruit uh, to your water, jazz it up a little. I promise you after a while, you're, you're not gonna miss the sodas, you're not gonna miss the milk uh, and you're really gonna appreciate the water. Um, it does taste, taste better after you've gotten off the sodas. Physical activity, uh, really encourage your patients to exercise. Um, you know, I'll often tell my patients, it doesn't matter how much you exercise a day to begin with, just make sure you do something every day. A lot of these patients have been very sedentary. And so if they just get up and walk, um, you know, down to their mailbox uh, twice a day, I'll take it, do something every day, and then slowly build on that. Once you've mastered the mailbox twice a day, start walking around the block uh, twice a day. And then once you've done that, you can go up from there. Our goal is to get them to do, um, uh, 
30 minutes of activity, um, at least, uh, well, now, now it's been a while. I, I encourage my patients to do it every day. I mean, they can take a day off each week, but if I can get them up to 30 to 60 minutes of activity uh, every day of the week, um, I think that's fantastic. The more the merrier. I used to follow the guidelines, um, but I've encouraged patients to really, um, wherever they're at, just to just keep building up on that. And if they can get up to 60 minutes, six times a week, uh, I'd be really pleased with that. Um, <clears throat> so should they be exercising after fasting? Probably not. We should encourage them to eat something before the exercise so they have some fuel to go off of. Uh, but making uh, an after dinner walk has a huge benefit. It lowers their blood sugars after dinner and actually is uh, very powerful at, at lowering A1C. Okay, glucose monitoring. Is uh, continuous glucose monitoring or CGM ideal uh, and for what patients? Yes, absolutely, um, it is. Uh, I've been using the CGMs for lots of patients, in particular my patients who are on insulin. Um, they need that extra level of monitoring to help them with the nuances of taking care of their diabetes with insulin. Um, is it covered by Care Oregon? Uh, I actually asked this question and hopefully uh, we'll get some uh, answers later in this uh, program. Um, it, it is a DME, uh, durable medical equipment. So if it is covered, it's going through a different route uh, than what our drugs are. Uh, and hopefully we'll hear more about that later in the presentation. Uh, and then how much monitoring is necessary for patients who are just on orals or, or GLP-1 agonists only? Honestly, um, probably once a day, uh, checking their blood sugars, it's fine. If you're on insulin, you should be at least checking three times a day. Um, however, when I ask my patients to check once daily, I ask them to alternate when they check. Uh, ideally, they check one day before breakfast, next day before lunch, next day before dinner, next day at bedtime. That way they're only poking themselves once a day, uh, but then I can see all those different times times during their day and really get a sense of where we need to head next. Um, I'll take what I can get with my patients. Oftentimes, all I can get is they'll alternate breakfast and dinner. Fine. If that's all I get, I'll, I'll take it. Like I said, more than, more than once daily at breakfast um, is going to be helpful for me. Some patients will just do breakfast and uh, bedtime to alternate those two, which is appropriate. All right, uh, so engagement strategies. With COVID-19's impact on chronic management diseases, I, I'm sure you guys have uh, seen that it's really important for us to re-engage with these uh, patients. Um, the COVID, uh, most of my patients did not do well uh, during the COVID uh, uh, outbreak. Uh, being stuck at home, one, it made them less active. Two, it made them uh, depressed, so they made worse decisions. And three, they were just stuck at home uh, and what do you do when you're stuck at home? You eat and probably too much. What was interesting is I did have a small subset of uh, diabetics who actually did better uh, being at home. They were able to cook on their own, make better choices. Uh, they didn't eat out, uh, which had a big impact. But again, the majority of my patients did not do well. In fact, um, a lot of our patients didn't even come in and see us uh, during the coronavirus. Uh, and so as a result, now that we're checking in with them, you can see their A1Cs are just way too high. Uh, so what are the best ways to get the patients invested in their care? Um, you know, all those decisions that we were just kind of going over, I let the uh, patients help be a part of that decision-making process. And when the patient uh, is engaged in, in what they're taking, uh, they're a lot more likely uh, to, to adhere uh, to their regimen. Um, and re remember that there's programs to support people with diabetes. Uh, again, later uh, in this presentation, you'll hear more specifically about those programs that we have available for our patients. All right, so in closing, I'm gonna go through this just one more time because again, uh, this is really important. Um, we have an algorithm. Uh, Care Oregon is uh, helping make this uh, an easier process for us, for us and we just kind of follow the algorithm. So again, the preferred agents, first line metformin, second line, either a sulfonylurea or a pyoglitazone. Uh, if they fail those two, then we can go on to the non-preferred uh, oral agents. This does require for authorization, but now's the time to think about allogliptin or steglatro, or again, farsiga, uh, if the patient has heart failure, heart disease, or chronic kidney disease. 
Uh, you do have to do the pressurization. So um, you have to one, say that they failed metformin and they failed either sulfonylurea or pyoglitazone. And uh, we should be thinking about these uh, patients with A1C seven to 10. If, if they're higher than 10, they probably need injection, injections at that point. And when you get to the level of injections, the fourth line, if they fail um, the first three, uh, be thinking of uh, starting either Basaglar or Semgly once daily, <clears throat> and we went through that. Uh, and then consider when is mealtime uh, insulin appropriate? Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then we can move on to the fifth line, uh, the non-preferred injections. Uh, and this is where we really start thinking about uh, the GOP-1 agonists, the bidurian, the bieta, the trulicity or the victosa. <clears throat> Again, the uh, prioritization uh, is required for this, and so you'll have to prove that they failed metformin, uh, prove that uh, they failed either uh, two of the sulfonylurea, allogliptin, steglatro, or pyoglitazone. Also, uh, you have to prove that they've uh, failed uh, basal insulin or have a good uh, medical rationale to avoid basal insulin. So if you have a very obese patient and you don't want to add insulin, you can uh, skip the fourth line and jump to the fifth line. Uh, but you just have to mention that in your prioritization that, hey, I do believe um, with this patient, weight gain is an issue. Um, insulin resistance is an issue because of their obesity. And so I do feel like the um, GLP-1 agonist would be better for them. Um, and again, uh, the A1C uh, here, it's listed, but it's not a hard, fast uh, cutoff. If their A1Cs are higher than 10% and you feel it's appropriate, uh, we can still get those uh, GLP-1 eggs uh, paid for. Um, some other things to kind of keep in mind, um, if, uh, if they're not a goal of three months, you proceed uh, to the next step. Uh, review for treatment barriers. We should always be uh, considering our uh, treatment barriers. Um, <clears throat> what's, what's keeping them from being successful? Are they adherent to the treatment? Uh, do they have uh, behavioral health issues that obviously make uh, treating the diabetes um, a lot more difficult or social determinants? And this is when we can use uh, some of the uh, help that's in our community. Consider frequent follow-up, especially now that uh, we're seeing them after the COVID, uh, we might wanna be seeing them quickly uh, in return just to make sure that uh, if they are having problems uh, that we're engaging them uh, into the right uh, uh, support system in our community. And, and along that vein, uh, look for uh, behavioral health coordinators uh, and or uh, clinical pharmacists. They're there for us as well uh, to help us with this. Um, <clears throat> so just to highlight the changes here, um, again, uh, they've added the SGLT2 uh, indications, in particular for SIGA for patients with heart disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, and, um, and CHF. Um, they've removed that hard, fast uh, level of the A1C um, and that they simplified uh, to preferred and non-preferred options. And they've also given us the uh, prioritization criteria. So if we use the non-preferred, they they've given us the pathway on how to get those covered. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to um, put those in uh, the chat bar and we can start answering those uh, at the Q&A session. Uh, thanks again.